I'm Dr. Mark Solomon, and in this video, I'm going to cover exactly how we at the Colon and Rectal Clinic of Orlando train our colorectal fellows and residents on how to do robotic surgery. Now, this video is going to have a few different spins on it. I am the fellowship director for the Advanced Minimally Invasive Colorectal Surgical Fellowship and also the associate program director for the ACGME accredited colorectal residency. And part of that has been one of the greatest professional blessings of my life to be able to serve as one of the national program directors for for the APDCRS robotics training program that the governing body of the colorectal fellowship puts on annual training courses for all of the colorectal residents. And why I bring this up is that this curriculum that I'm going to share with you is what we do at my program at the Colon Rectal Clinic of Orlando. And it's something that we have scaled up with the partnership of two of my mentors and friends, Drs. Bob Cleary and Dr. Amir Bastaros, and how we have incorporated our curriculum to the national curriculum. And I'm going to show you exactly what we have done locally and how it ties into the national curriculum and what it looks like and how you can also incorporate this into your local program. There are many obvious challenges that come when trying to implement robotics into a residency program or a fellowship program in this instance. One of the big things is a program volume. Another one that I hear all the time, and I suffer with this myself, was being an attending on the learning curve. Also, a resident having limited console time is a tremendous bottleneck in the way in which those residents are able to obtain robotic skills. And, and some programs don't have an organized pathway, and of course, there's sometimes limited access to the robot. So when it comes to building a robotics training program, there has to be first and foremost buy-in. That buy-in has to come from either the program director or a specific surgeon champion. And when I first started faculty, I was the robot guy for the practice. I wasn't the program director, but I was the surgeon champion of the group, and I eventually moved into the program director role. You also have to have buy-in from not just one attending that is a surgeon champion, but the other attendings that would support the objective of robotics training. Also, there has to be buy-in from the residents, because if the residents themselves or the fellows themselves aren't keen on learning robotics, you can forget about teaching robotics, because they're not going to put the extra time that it requires into learning the platform. There has to be buy-in from the OR staff, and actually, this is where industry comes in helpful, because there has to be a lot of buy-in from the local intuitive rep, because a lot of the curriculum that we do is dependent upon the intuitive rep for doing evening courses and evening dry docking exercises for our local fellows. Now, there also has to be, in my opinion, a clear expression of the objectives to the incoming residents and fellows so they know exactly what's going to happen during their curriculum. And there has to be a clear pathway that we're going to outline today. As I mentioned before, the APDCRS, which is the Association for Program Directors of Colorectal Surgery, is the governing body that oversees all of the colorectal residency programs in the country. And through the APDCRS, Drs. Bob Cleary, Dr. Amir Vassaris, and myself were able to put on, we have now trained nearly 600 colorectal fellows over the past eight years. And this curriculum that I'm going to show you right now is going to have the APDCRS requirements peppered into it. So you know exactly how the APDCRS requires things, but how we locally are incorporating them into our local curriculum. So let's now move on to the curriculum overview and how we actually implemented. I break this down in our program into four different phases. We start at phase zero, which is basically before the fellowship begins and into the first month. Phase one, which is typically within the first few months of fellowship, usually the first rotation essentially. Phase two is basically towards the end of the first rotation, maybe the second rotation on robotics rotation. And the third phase is really honing skills. This is at the end of the second rotation or even into a third rotation if there is one. Now, what I'm going to do is break down each of these phases into objectives and what's going to happen in terms of simulation and clinical goals. So for phase zero, the basic objectives here is we want the fellows to understand the advantages and disadvantages of robotics. We want them to understand the system components. We want them to understand patient safety issues and specifically patient and operative selection during the first part of their learning curve and during the first part of the year. We're going to talk a lot about during this time dry docking and how to actually dock and undock and safe instrument insertion and exchange. And this is again going to happen at the very beginning of fellowship. And so this is also going to come with very basic simulation exercises. And every phase is going to have simulation and every phase is going to have some clinical objectives as well. So during phase zero, fellows must get at least a 90% or greater score on the 
these are exercises which are camera targeting level one, camera targeting level two, scaling, and they have to do select online modules on the DaVinci surgical community such as Energy and there's a few others that really are critical for them to understand exactly how the platform works. So now moving into phase one, and this again, this is roughly around the beginning of the first rotation. So the objectives of phase one is that we really want them to become comfortable with basic instrument manipulation, including camera control and clutching. This is also the time that we really want to make sure that they're safe and fluid during the movement of the robotic arms, minimize the erratic nature of how the robotic arms are being moved around, and understand how the robot externally is interacting with the patient. So this is very key when we're doing our dry docking exercises and we're taking time to dock the robot. We're taking a lot of time to show exactly how these external interactions are occurring with the patient him or herself. During phase one, we're also doing port placement philosophy and strategy. We're really stressing very hard the ability to use visual cues to assess tissue tension. And this is important, especially when it comes to video review, which I and my program mandate. Every single operation that's done is recorded and the fellows review that. And we make sure that they understand what the visual cues are during that operation so they can not only assess tissue tension, but they can know what to improve on the very next operation. Also during phase one, we want to make sure they have proficient use of the monopolar and bipolar cautery for dissection as well as hemostasis. And from a clinical standpoint, we want to make sure that the residents have a good grasp of what the bedside assistant role is. Now, I know that this is something that can be a little bit emotional. Assisting at the bedside, however, has tremendous value as a console surgeon. And let me explain what I mean by that. If you don't know what you're doing at the bedside, and you're on a console and you get in trouble, whether you have an internal collision, an external collision, and you're out in the middle of your hospital, in the middle of nowhere, and you have never assisted at the bedside, it's going to be impossible for you as a console surgeon, having no knowledge of how to troubleshoot or debug what's happening at the bedside, it'll be impossible for you as a console surgeon to be able to tell your team exactly how to fix the issue that's occurring at the bedside. So that's why we at our program mandate at least five bedside cases to be done before we transition you over to the console. Now, this doesn't mean that I will never let you touch the console if you haven't done at least five cases. No, no, that's not the case. I want you to get at least five console cases at some point during your rotation, usually that's within your first month, but sometimes it's going to be interspersed within your first month, especially if you come in with a tremendous amount of bedside assisting cases already from residency. During this first phase, and again, it's usually around the first month, you're doing a lot of mobilization, a lot of clonic attachments, stuff that you're really just trying to get an idea of what the tissue tension is and what bipolar cautery feels like, what monopolar cautery feels like, how much you can pull using the robotic instrumentation. And during this phase, it's critically important that we do simulation. The simulation exercises I really stress here are match boards, level one, two, and three, dots and needles, levels one and two, needle targeting, ring and rail one and two. Now, why did I pick these? Well, each one of these exercises has a specific clinical applicability to it. So for example, match boards level one, two, and three help tremendously with depth perception. And if you are unable to really have good depth perception, it's very difficult then to translate that, for example, to sew an ileocolic anastomosis, or how do you wrist around an IMA pedicle? Same thing with dots and needles, same thing with needle targeting. If you're unable to clutch and really get the needle pointed in the correct direction, how can I then trust you to sew an ileocolic anastomosis? Or how can I trust you to do a suture ligature if needed on a bleeding vascular pedicle? So that's why it's critical important that we get these very basic exercises out of the way at the very beginning during phase one. And ring and rail similarly is, has to do a lot with 3D, uh, 3D uh, has a lot to do with 3D visualization, wristing around structures, etc. All right, phase two. This is towards the tail end of the first rotation, usually into the second rotation. And this is where we're really stressing proficient use of robotic sampling device, proficiency in suturing, and also proficient use of the third arm. Now the third arm, proficient. Now, you're not going to master it. Mastery takes probably 40, 50 cases for you to really get better at the third arm, but this is where we really start stressing how to use the instruments, where to put them, how to clutch them, where to wrist them, etc. From a clinical standpoint, and this is an example, on a left colectomy, this is where we want to at least have you perform somewhat of a portion of the team, maybe not the entirety, but at least some of it, and a completion of the majority of the left colonic mobilization in a sigmoid section or a lower anterior section. And in a right colectomy, we talk about 
the completion of the majority of the ascending collective immobilization, and also the completion of nearly the entirety of the intracorporeal iliocolic anastomosis. And so actually, I will give my fellows the right colectomy from the end of the case to the beginning, meaning the very first day on my service, the very first thing to do, the sew the iliocolic anastomosis. It's a very technical operation. I know exactly where to put the sutures. I know exactly how far to advance the needle, how much tissue to purchase, how much tension to put down. It's a very reproducible, very algorithmic way to get that thing done. So they'll do the anastomosis on one case. Then the next case, what they'll do is the stapling, then the anastomosis. Then the next, next case, they'll do the division of the TI, the division of the transverse colon, and then do the anastomosis. And etc. we're going to work them from backwards to forwards. LAR, a little bit different. LAR, I'm going to take it from basically the parts that you can't mess up. You can't mess up the lateral mobilization that bad assuming you do a good medial lateral dissection. And so, for example, on a left collectomy or low anterior section, I'll, for example, start the medial lateral mobilization. I'll divide the IMA pedicle, I'll find the left ureter, I'll free all the medial attachments, then I'll bring the fellow over to the console, let them take the lateral attachments so they can get a good assessment for the tissue tension, and maybe do a little bit of TME, but I'll type back over, and then I'll jump on for the TME, show them how it's done. In the next case, they do a little bit of the lateral dissection, then they do a little bit of the TME until they get stuck, then I'll take over. In the next, next case, I'll take the IMA, let them do the medial lateral, let them take the lateral attachment, let them do the TME until they get stuck, let them do the distal rectum until they get stuck, etc. And that's how we increase their level of a participation in the operation in a stepwise manner. Phase two simulation exercises are also very important. Talk about pegboards one and two, pick and place, energy dissections one and two, and energy switching levels one or two. Now again, these are all increasing in complexity, increasing in 3D perception, and how to clutch and how to move and how to really have your hands talk to each other, which is critical as we start doing the TME and as we start wristing around blood vessels, etc into phase three and this is really where we're approaching into the more technical refinement of the fellows and this is where we really want the fellows to have extreme competent manipulation of the flex joints and if you don't know what i'm talking about here I'll, I'll link a video on the card above to talk about what the flex joints are we want to talk about swapping and master controls we want to have proficient exchange of tissue without undue external or internal collisions and I'll link to another video in the description of what I mean by that but basically we really want the fellows to have the ability to be able to pass tissue off to themselves and not be too clumsy not be too violent with the tissue or risk injuring anything from a clinical standpoint the goals here are really completion of the entirety of the TME and lower to resection the ability to complete the entirety of the ascending colectomy with intracorporeal anastomosis and this is where the APD CRS curriculum kind of comes in these next two bullet points we want we want from the APD CRS curriculum for our fellows to complete their fellowship with the ability to have an equivalency certificate in hand. Now, what is that? An equivalency certificate is one that once the fellows or residents graduate from their program, they're able to take that certificate to their new hospital and not have to go and get retrained in robotics. Now, how do we get that? Well, we got to abide by some of Intuitive's rules, which say that you have to complete 20 cases having done the majority of the procedure steps with the resident at the console. Now, your definition of majority differs. It doesn't have to be a specific time on the console. It doesn't have to be a specific step of the operation. It just has to be the majority of the case being done as a console surgeon. And so while we at the APDCRS don't mandate the 20, it is mandated that you have to get 20 in order to get the equivalency certificate. Now, what we do mandate at the APDCRS, and I'll talk about that in just a second, is that we really need you to get at least five console cases, having been the majority surgeon on the console during that case, in order to qualify to come to the advanced robotic courses so you can refine your technique at the end of your academic year. The other thing that we suggest, and this is what we do in our program, we want you to log at a bare minimum of 35 cases by the end of the academic year. Our fellows typically log at least 35, some are up to 50 and 60, just depending on the fellow and then the year and how the rotations line up. The reason we pick that number 35 is because there have been multiple studies to show that the learning curve for robotic colorectal surgery is between 35 to 40 cases. And that's why we want our fellows to really get through the learning curve by the time that they graduate so that when they graduate, they hit the ground running. They don't have to renegotiate their learning curve once they finish. Phase three has continued simulation where it comes stacking challenges, ring walks levels one, two, and three, and suture sponge levels one, two, and three as well. All right, so back to this diagram here. We talked about phase zero, which is the beginning of the year, phase one, which is basically the first rotation, phase two, middle part of the year, phase three, towards the end of the year. Now, I have these red circles indicated here at the bottom of the screen. And what these circles represent are the dates in which the APD CRS have advanced colorectal courses that we will train the colorectal fellows nationwide for procedure refinement. Each one of these dates has 
a different value to it. The January date is really designed for the higher volume programs. Those that the residents by say December have done 30, 40 cases and they want to come in January and continue to refine their techniques so that the way the second half of the year is smoother sailing and they can figure it out. This is for the higher volume programs. April course is probably the most attended course that we have and this is for pretty much the majority of the groups and again it's for those that have done 20 30 cases but again the minimum is five but i've done plenty of cases and come for procedure refinement before they leave the july course there's two buckets of people. It can be the high volume programs. It also could be the lower volume programs where those that need more time to get to that five console case minimum before they can come to an advanced course. But personally, my fellows go to the July course because they know that they know what they're doing throughout the academic year, but they graduate the 40, 50 cases. They can really use that last time in the cadaver lab to completely refine their technique before they hit the ground running in their own practice when they graduate the next month. So these course dates will be sent out and selected by the program coordinators and program directors, as well as the residents, depending upon where they are in terms of volume throughout the year. So this is a table of the summation of each of the phases. Phase zero includes online modules, dry labs that have to be done, and usually by the participation of the intuitive rep, usually at night, which is what we do during our orientation week, and also during the first month or so of fellowship and consistent use of simulation exercises. Phase one, bedside assist for about five cases, simulation exercises. We then begin to transition to the console, an intense video review, both personal and gold standard. Phase two, simulation exercises, incremental increase in console time, as I discussed before, and also intense video review, both personal and gold standard. I can't overemphasize this enough. You must, must, must be able to record your videos. If not able to, do whatever you can to review someone's video because watching how it should be done makes your operation go so much better when you're able to visualize how the operation should go you watch it here and you watch it and then reproduce it in your own operating room in phase three this is the refinement stage where you're still doing simulation exercises you're still getting incremental increase in console time with a goal of getting 20 cases as a majority console surgeon and again that 20 number is the magic number that allows you to qualify for your equivalency certificate the number to qualify for the advanced course is five but of course the more the better and this time is continued with intense video review and this is around the time during phase three is when we're having you register for the advanced apd crs robotics course and also to begin also applying for the equivalency certificate towards the end of the fellowship year. All right, so that was a curriculum overview on how we locally implement the APD CRS curriculum into our program at the Colonel Curve Clinic of Orlando. Let's talk a little bit about navigating the learning curve from an attending standpoint. This is a problem because, I mean, I was one of those attendings because I was learning how to do robotics as I was training fellows. But what we find, though, is that even though I might be on my learning curve, the fellows are still going to learn from my mistakes. Watching how painful it is for me to operate, my fellows learned a lot, actually, during that. And I would give bits and pieces of the cases that I knew that I was pretty good at, like again, the, the lateral colonic mobilization. If my focus on a specific case, say case number, for example, 10, was the TME, I would let the fellow do, for example, the lateral mobilization because at that point I've done 10 lateral mobilizations. I felt better about that part of the operation. And then I would focus on the TME. And then when I began transitioning the TME over to the fellow, I always had this study here to fall back on to make me feel better about it because what this study shows is that once you get to around 35 to 40 cases, that's that's when you get through your learning curve. And what's even more compelling is this next study, which actually shows that the quality of the total mesorectal excision and the depth of the circumferential section margins of rectal cancer actually becomes equivalent even while you're on your learning curve, which means that while I'm on my learning curve as an attending or my resident is on their learning curve during their training, the quality of the TME to section is actually equivalent across the board, which is good. So that means that if I find that they're making a mistake, I can very quickly correct them. And if it gets out of hand, that I can always take them off the console. But the good thing about the study is it actually encourages me to know that at least by the data there is no statistical difference in the quality of the TME even if you're on your index robotics learning curve. So I have some tips for navigating the attending learning curve. Again, I lived this very vividly. And what I want to encourage my colleagues to do is you must just start. It may be uncomfortable. It may be difficult. It may be humbling. And in fact, it will be humbling you as the master surgeon in front of your trainees. But you must just start because there's never going to be a perfect 
time to start this. So just start doing the cases and set realistic goals for every single one of these operations. And what I will very openly say is at the beginning of case, not even I'm at case number 600 right now, at the very beginning of every single operation that I do, I set a realistic goal for myself and the entire room. I'll tell them that my goal for this operation today is, for example, I'm going to divide the IMA pedicle laparoscopically. I'm then going to take the splenic flexure down laparoscopically. I'm only going to dock for the pelvic dissection and do the TME robotically for one hour. And then no matter what, I'm opening after that. Now, that may not be how you want to do it, but I'm just giving an example. But if you do that, if you announce to the room your goals for that specific operation, it takes the pressure off you as an attending to try to overperform well beyond your abilities in that first few cases during your learning curve. And it really makes it a far more relaxing case and everyone kind of understands. And that's the case that, for example, you let your resident take the IMA down lap. You let your resident take the flexure down lap and you do the one pelvic part of the operation robotically, etc. The other thing I highly encourage using simulation if you have it and if you don't have it, get your hands on as many videos as you possibly can, including this YouTube channel and many, many, many other resources that are out there. And consider graded implementation. As I mentioned, you may not choose to perform the entire case robotically in the beginning of your learning curve. Implement it in a piecemeal fashion. I don't care. Just start. Just do. Because the more you do, the better you get. The better you get, the more you're able to do. And the more your residents get to do, the quicker you get through your learning curve. So it's important to start and to move through it. And the other thing I also recommend is definitely track your progress. I mean, don't get all formal and get an IRB for this stuff. Just understand that you want to track roughly your skin to skin time, your console time and how you're doing on dry docking and docking, just making sure that you're making iterative improvements throughout your learning curve. Check your outcomes too. I mean, it's a good idea, of course, to track your margins, lymph node counts, length of stay complications and do your own series. Yes, that wouldn't require IRB or approval, but it's one of those things that would certainly make for compelling data and publications for their program. And one other thing that's quite important is, of course, evaluation of our residents. As we incorporate this into our programs, how do we actually do this? Well, there are two broad scoring systems that we use. The first one is called the GEAR score. GEARS is specifically designed for evaluating our fellows during robotic surgery. And it has these six domains for a total score of 30. And in truth, we actually only use five of the domains most commonly for a total score of 25. But basically, each of these acts as a rubric. So you can see here, depth perception, fellow constantly overshoots target, wide swing, slow to correct, or five, accurately directs instruments to the correct plan to target each and every time. And it goes on and on for this, depth perception, by manual dexterity, their efficiency, their force sensitivity, their autonomy, and of course their robotic control. So these domains here give a total score that we give to our fellows after every single operation that they do. And this makes it a rubric and makes it relatively objective. It's never completely objective, but it's as objective as you can possibly get at the end of an operation. And then we we'll also do what's called a gas score. The gas score, this is specific to colorectal surgery, has nothing to do, to do with the robotics. And each one of these things, we give them a one through six score in exposure. So did you correctly set up the OR? You get a score of one through six. Did you correctly position a patient? One to six. Did you safely access the abdomen? One through six. Exposure of the operative field, etc. So exposure just for vascular di dissection, for the mobilization, for the anastomosis, and for just general overall performance. And these things allow us to track and trend the resident performance throughout their academic year so we can have an idea of exactly how they've done, how they can improve, and where they can iterate and improve on in the very next operation. All right. So I just ran you through the Colorectal Clinic of Orlando's implementation of the robotics training program that we have, and also how I've peppered in the APDCRS requirements for the equipment certificate and also for qualifying for the advanced robotics course. I hope this video was of some use. I encourage you to take a look at it, modify it, and implement your curriculum similar to ours, or please change it and definitely leave in the comments how you like it, what you don't. Maybe I can improve our program here at the Colon Rectal Clinic of Orlando. Keep in touch. Thanks for listening and take care.